much. Can I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 18th meeting of 2015? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as interfield broadcasting, even when switched to silent? Apologies have been received from Margaret Mitchell and Gil Patterson. Only one item today, and it's a further uh, evidence session on the Prisoners Control of Lease Scotland Bill, um, and on the, it's on particular on the government amendments to this bill, which we heard from the Cabinet Secretary yesterday. Um, copies of the official report for that session, you should have them in front of you. And I, I thank the OR for you know, getting them to us so swiftly. Um, uh, there's no pay rise in that, it's just thanks. Okay? Um, I also wish to put in record the committee's thanks to those who provided written submissions on the amendments, which was a very tight timescale, which have been really useful in assisting our scrutiny. I welcome the meeting and I thank you both for, for coming again at relatively short notice. Professor Fergus McNeil, Professor of Criminology and Social Work, University of Glasgow, and Professor Cyrus Tatter, Professor of Law, Criminal Justice, University of Strathclyde. And you, you've had an opportunity, I hope, to have a look at the evidence from the Cabinet Secretary, yes, and thank you. And I'll go straight to questions from members, please. Uh, I've got Elaine, then I've got uh, Christian. Hi. Thanks, Convener. Um, as you'll be aware, the uh, amendments now have a, a, a period which is served in, in custody and then a, a six-month period to be served in the community, uh, irrespective of the length of the sentence for anybody who's sentenced to over four years. I wondered whether you agree that that was the best way of addressing the issues about cold release, if automatic early release was got rid of altogether, or whether you think that a more proportionate response to the type of crime the length of sentence would have been more appropriate? Yes. Professor yeah. Tetter, do you want to lower um, it? I think the simple answer to that is, unfortunately, no. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, having you'll be aware that we argued for, and, and the committee rightly saw the merit in having a period of mandatory supervised release to get away from the problem of so-called cold release. That's sensible from what was initially a rather foolish proposal. Um, but is this the best way of going forward? No. Um, should it be proportionate? Yes. Uh, for a number of reasons, I think it should be proportionate. Um, it does kind of change the dynamic in terms of how long someone serves, in terms of the sentencing decisions. But I think more than that, I'd, I'd like to I'll raise... I'll on that point mm. first, would you, about changing the dynamic, which was touched on, I think, by mm. Rod Campbell yesterday, but not really mm. followed through. So just if you explain for public outside what you mean by changing yeah. the dynamic. Well, it means that someone serving a period of, say, four years will have to be released by three years, six months, but someone serving a period of 12 years will end up serving, mm. uh, you know... 11 and a half years, so the percentages, I haven't quite managed to work that out That's at this moment, right. are clearly hugely different. Right. It will also mean, by the way, something that the government uh, paper that came out just last week, um, where it said, I think, that, well, we don't see any problem with human rights in terms of the provision of programmes. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. yes. There's a clear principle which uh, is, has been evolving in case law derived from the European Convention on Human Rights with where it's said that you must have fair opportunity to be able to show that you are not a risk to the public. Now, when you change the proportions, when you change, when you squeeze down the length of conditional release so far just to six months, it means that someone, say, serving 12 years, um, who might have been released after, say, eight, may be held until 11 years, six months. Now, they may argue, and some will, argue, yes. I have not been given fair opportunity to demonstrate I am not a risk. Now, there is some case law, admittedly in, initially in indeterminate cases, well, which suggests that this, I, I think we can expect this principle to be extrapolated to determinate sentence cases as well. So I think it should be proportionate. I'm not sure I understand the reason why it said it's not proportionate. Uh, why one would go for a blanket six-month approach. I haven't really heard a reason. I know that the Justice Committee said we want to know one of your recommendations is why these periods have been proposed. All I'm aware of is it just feels about right. Um, I think it should be proportionate. It makes sense for it to be proportionate. I think in fairness to the Cabinet Secretary, he says at column... I don't know which column it is, column two or whatever it is. I'm conscious that I've received evidence that six to 12 weeks after prison release are the period of risk. So I think he was basing it on a risk assessment 
uh, that by making it that period of time, it gives an opportunity of moving from within the prison and having rehab within the prison out to that period covering a risk period and hopefully therefore prevent reoffending or risk to the public. I think that's, I'm reading what you said there and yes. I think that's what you said in, in the report. Yeah, uh, and in a sense, in one sense, it's logical that of course the first few days and first few weeks are, if you like, generally speaking, of course every individual is different, the highest level of risk. But it doesn't mean to say that therefore in months down the line one shouldn't also be looking at that. Um, and I think we really need evidence from criminal justice social work on that, but my colleague here, Professor McNeil, has immense knowledge about the level of risk. But can social workers really do the kind of work they need to do in six months? I'm sceptical about that. Just to pick up on it, I think there are two problems with having a fixed period, um, and these, these would apply to varying degrees, no matter how long the fixed period was. So uh, just to get the maths and, and make the kind of proportionality point clear, um, what, what the current proposal means is that now if you're sentenced to five years, 90% of your, your custodial sentence is in fact in prison. But if you're sentenced to 10 years, it's 95% and, and so on. As the sentence length extends, the, the proportionate effect um, or the, the, disproportionate the disproportionate shrinkage of the supervisory part becomes more uh, aggravated as the sentence length grows. Uh, which actually makes sentencing less transparent. It makes the, the meaning of a custodial sentence different depending on its length. If you follow my logic, how much of it is custodial and how much of it is supervisory mm -hmm. is now changing with sentence length instead of being fixed proportionately. That's, that's one problem. I think that's, that is some kind of problem for proportionality in relation to justice, but I'll confine myself more to, to the, the, the stuff which I know better, which is about the practicalities of supervising um, people after release safely. So, yes, the Cabinet Secretary is absolutely right that the first six weeks to three months are the critical period when uh, establishing the basics for successful resettlement and reintegration must be achieved. So that's, you know, housing, establishing benefits claims or finding employment, mm. the immediate uh, renegotiation of entry into the family, the, the way that that affects family dynamics, uh, the re-engagement or not with friends, yes. neighbours, informal social networks, all of that stuff is going to be critically important to manage carefully in the first um, three months or so. However, imagine yourself in the position of coming out of prison after serving 10 years. Um, maybe the, a, a way to try and, and think your way into this without having been a prisoner is to think about perhaps having worked overseas or just moving house. How long does it take for you to feel that you belong mm -hmm. and feel safe in the community that you've come to? <coughs> How long do you feel a part of its everyday life um, in such a way that uh, you are uh, relaxed um, and uh, confident in the way that you navigate your, your routines? Um, and it seems obvious to me that if you've spent 10 years in prison Six months is a very short period of time, not least because of the accumulated effects of the institutionalisation that a long sentence brings. Um, and if then, if you if you flip perspective and put yourself in the seat of the social worker who's supervising that person, if you've done nine and a half years out of ten because you haven't been deemed eligible for parole, yes, there are two reasons why that two basic reasons why you might not have, have been released early. One could be to do with you, so your engagement with programmes, your participation in rehabilitation, your attitudes, whether or not you've been able to address so-called risk factors. But the other set of reasons are about your social environment. The Parole Board also receives reports from a social worker based in the community about the proposed address and the suitability of the social context and whether that's going to conduce towards offending or conduce towards desistance from offending. Um, and if, if, you're, if the legislation means that as a social worker I have just six months to A, work with this individual to address the issues that weren't successfully addressed in prison and B, engage with their social network in such a way as to facilitate their successful um, re-entry and reduce risks. I don't know. I mean, I, I think, to be honest, I'd be throwing up my hands and saying 
there's no way I can deal with all of these issues in six months. I need longer. I need longer both to incentivize the person to engage with me in the community, and I need longer because the issues are complicated. So I, I think six months is too short, um, and particularly for longer sentence prisoners. And just to make the point, of course, these are people who have been denied discretionary release. Mm. So for whatever reason, they have been deemed to be too risky rightly or wrongly, to be released earlier. So we're actually dealing with those that are assumed to be most of greatest risk to the public. Why would we want to squeeze that period right down to six months? Given that um, the bill doesn't actually end automatic early release anymore, it just changes when it uh, early release happens, would it have been preferable, in your view, to have had that defined, say, as a percentage of sentence, 10% of sentence or whatever being served in the community rather than six months? Without doubt, it would be sensible to define it as a percentage, um, definitely. And, it, and as you rightly say, the bill doesn't mm. end automatic mm. early release. And I do ask the question, I'm genuinely puzzled, what is this bill trying to achieve? What problem is this bill trying to solve? Now, if it's the electoral political manifesto problem, the, the SNP manifesto, 2011, this wasn't a manifesto commitment. In fact, what it was, we remain committed to ending automatic early release. Mm -hmm. As you say, mm -hmm. it's not now doing that, so they're left with the same problem. But it then does say, give itself the caveat, once the criteria set by the McLeish Commission mm -hmm. are met, and the criteria about the are about lowering prison numbers. Yes, yes, so I don't me. understand, I genuinely am puzzled, what problem is this bill seeking to solve? It seems to me to be actually attacking the very bit of the release system that works the best. It actually works pretty well. And you've heard that before from the RMA and others. This works quite well, the long-term end. It's the short-term end where I'd have much greater criticism, where people are released nominally on, uh, on supervision, they don't get supervision, they don't get the kind of support. I, I, I'm just puzzled as to why we're going for the long-term, the part that works the best. Why would we tackle that? So it can't be to do with... Presumably, it doesn't. It doesn't solve any political problem around a manifesto commitment because it doesn't achieve the first part. But in any case, there was latitude that it allowed the, the SNP manifesto allowed itself. So, what problem is it trying to achieve? Address? Is it public safety? Well, we've been here before. We know that conditional, supervised, mandatory release is necessary. Well, you've, you've rightly said as a committee, you've got to have that in there. The government has relented. Um, but these are the people, remember, we're talking about the people who are deemed too risky, long-term prisoners, who are deemed too risky to release at the discretionary point. Why would you want to squeeze the mandatory point of supervision and support right down to six months? I don't get it. Just, just to answer the question, um, I, I do think that a proportional system makes more sense, and, and I think you can have it and abolish automatic early release, but to do so, you need to change what the sentence is and what the sentence means. So it, it seems to me that the, the device that's required is something like uh, a, custodi a custodial and supervisory sentence, mm. which has two elements. Uh, you can have a sliding scale part in the middle where the parole board still exercises mm -hmm. a measure of discretion in, in light yeah, of judgments about risk and progress. Um, but then I would say and this is somewhat arbitrary, no later than three quarters you have to be released under mandatory mm -hmm. supervision um, to continue to address the risks and needs and to continue to be supported with the reintegration journey yeah. post-release. Isn't this where we've already been? Haven't we already been here with the Custodial Weapons and Licensing Act of 2007 and its amendment later on? We've actually yeah. already with, been here. Without getting into the technicalities, yeah. that bill had lots of mm -hmm. other flaws, mm -hmm. and, and I think... Um, can't be implemented in its in in the form in which it was passed. Yeah. So I think it, it's not a case of going back to that act, but that principle mm -hmm. that a custodial sentence, in fact, must have two parts, and that the the the, the two mm -hmm. parts need to be explicit when the sentence is passed. Mm -hmm. That can deal with the problem of automatic release, and it can deal with the underlying problem of transparency in sentencing. Mm -hmm. Have we not done that already under some other... Was it a life sentence where there was this odd formula that part of it had to be... Um, you were detained for the safety of the public, but part of it had to be 
um, for rehabilitation. What was that? The tariff part, but that's life. That's that's yeah, indeterminate that's, sentence. That's business. that's, that's yeah, life. We've already been there with. But with lifers. Of, yes, that's right. But I'm remembering part of it to me that's ECHR. Right. So it's sort of along the same lines. Yeah. So yes, what, uh, what we would, I mean, what a, the way to get out of this, I mean, clearly part of the motivation I, I would suggest for this is the concern that, that people feel that sentences don't mean what they say. And they're right. Yes. They don't mean what they say. They aren't clear and it's not transparent. And we need to be clear that, that if that's the problem we're trying to tackle, this isn't going to achieve it. The way to achieve it is to describe up front explicitly what the sentence is. All custodial sentences are a combination, rightly, as you've said in your reports, they should be, of custody and a mandatory period, it might be part discretionary, but then also a mandatory period within that sentence of supervision. So you can call it a custodial and, you know, supervised sentence or, or whatever. It's a question of just saying what the thing is, and we could get out of this bind. That way you can combine the virtue of public safety, namely supervising people on release, particularly those who are at greatest risk, who we deem to be of greatest risk. You can, you can ensure that they get the support and supervision that they need and the public needs for them to have, and you're able to say, this is what the sentence is. Mm -hmm. And it's about time, I think, we were up front with the public about that, because everybody knows now. I mean, in the 60s and 70s, when parole came in and so on, it was kind of a little bit... People didn't really know uh, that actually people were getting out early. Now everybody knows. And in fact, the public's very cynical. And sometimes the, the, the research suggests that they uh, imagine that people are let out earlier than in fact they are. So we need to be quite clear, and it's a matter of describing what the sentences are getting more clearly. Out as such. Mm -hmm. It's a change of sentence. Absolutely. It's a continuing yeah. sentence. A getting out of, yes. getting out of prison. I don't mean getting off. No, no, getting but people out think prison. getting out, Absolutely. getting off, mm -hmm. you know, with and that's part why of the we, sentence. Yes. And that's why we need to say exactly what it is. Are you wanting to ask somebody, Broad, because you're hopping about there? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. Uh, it's more of a comment in terms of, I think we've established that this bill is not about clarity in sentencing. It doesn't purport to be about clarity. And in terms of the proportionality point, I take your point on board. But we also heard evidence from victim support on the 13th of January, um, agreeing with SACRO that a three-month period at the end of the sentence would, would be what was required, which I think was accepted also by Mr Peter White of uh, Prisoners First. So um, they were happy with taking a kind of non-proportionate view. Um, you obviously take a different view, but there are other ways of looking at this. I think with Pete White's evidence, if I'm not mistaken, I think he briefly says, look, this is better than nothing. It's not as bad as before. I'm not sure he says that I think... Well, in fact, I've got, I th it, got it in front of you, me. You go ahead. I may be wrong on uh, that. Sarah, Sarah Crombie of Victim Sports said, Sacro's submission comments that it would be good to see a reduction of automatic early release to the last three months of the sentence. I know that Dr Barry talked about the average three-month planning time within the prison. Victim Support thinks that putting in place that three-month period to allow compulsory supervision to take place is something to look at. Uh, convener, does anyone else wish to comment? Peter White, I would agree with that. I think he's got written evidence. Point, Pete there's no anyway, points. Yeah. Okay, slow down a minute, please. Yeah. There's no points of order in committee. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for that. I, I wonder if it would just... Um, Professor Tata was alluding to Mr White's more recent evidence, uh, which is in our papers, and, and, and um, he does say that... That's a know, point of is. information. Well, I do beg your pardon. Thank you point very much. Thank you. I love there's no points of order here. Okay. It gives me some control. Um, yes, so, um, so we back, to, back to the issue, because the issue is you have two points you're making. Main points, I take it, is why six months? Mm -hmm. And why... And, that, and the proportionality... Um, they sort of mixed together. The proportionality doesn't fit, isn't fit for purpose because you've got people doing four years who get three and a half and people with ten years who do nine and a half. Yeah. Now, if we're trying to fix a bill um, and not just throw it out completely, um, you know, what, what do we look at? How do we do it with this? Because we can't deal with sentencing uh, policy here. No. I think we, we first need to decide what problem we are trying to solve. Well, we've solved one for you, which is which we is agreed what? you can't have cold release. 
and that, that that has been at least a move forward. And, and I think we'd all support that. We don't, you know, that was not a good idea. And it wasn't good if it was just sex offenders and so on, and it's moved on to all. So we've made some progress with so, the government. So, so transparency, as I understand it, victims groups, the main complaint is that it's not transparent. It's not right. clear. Now, there's a, as I say, there is a way to deal with that, which is about describing the sentence as it really is. And that way you can have a period of mandatory supervision, which is sufficient and without feeling as if it's, um, it's telling people that someone is getting one thing when they're doing another. Right. It's actually telling it as it is. OK, That's I don't know if we can do it in this bill or not. I'm going to add other members to come in. I've got, no, I've got Christian. Thanks very much, Governor. Good morning, Professor. Uh, I, I enjoy very much the conversation we had so far, but there's one point we may be missing because we talked about code release and we all agree on code release. But there's another point as well. Uh, we, we, we heard and we learned a lot about this max out, this opting for max out. And I thought that the changing that the cabinet secretary made, the government made, was really to pinpoint this. I think, because I, I don't know if you remember, I, I talked a little bit about mandatory uh, uh, pre release. Uh, period, you know, and Sacro said three months, and that was fine. He didn't talk about pro pro proportionality, and it seems to 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 to, 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 know, to know better than, 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 than some of us. But regarding this thing of max out, which we didn't realize that there are some offenders, some prisoners who will not want to engage, to, to force them to engage, we had to have that, uh, that little time for, for the one who will not do it discretionary with the power board be, beforehand. So it's not about everybody, it's just about that, that little numbers of people are more difficult. So that was on your written submission, Professor Fergus McNeil. And at the end of it, I, you had several points. And I think if I looked all these points, this seems to have been addressed, even the cost, because at the end of the day, we know it's not going to kick in before uh, uh, 2019. So, for all those reasons, you did say that you thought the bill should be abandoned. Where are you now? Well, I, I still think that the bill is um, is not fit for purpose in its current form. I, I suppose the two reasons now are that whether I understand this bill as being principally concerned with public safety, which is what it says yeah. it is, or whether I consider it as being um, important for it to deal with the issue of transparency, even if it, that's not its formal purpose, it's not achieving either for me. I think that the, for the reasons I gave earlier, as I kind of worked through the example of, of somebody serving a long sentence, I don't think that uh, holding somebody longer and then releasing them six months before the end of a sentence is the best way of securing public safety in the long term. What the, this is the dilemma that the parole board continually face. If you release earlier, you have longer supervision so, and therefore you have longer periods of support to try to navigate the re-entry challenges and and actually reduce risk and that means that when when the criminal justice system lets the person go they are being let go in a in a safer condition okay that's better for them they're better reintegrated it's better for the public because they're less likely to reoffend so, um, so hold, hold, hold on and on that discussion you are of the idea that automatic early release at two third was a good thing. I am, yeah. I mean, I so, think it, but, it, but it, 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 it's to make sure that nobody's maxed out. But the problem is, we get into cold release. We are back to the cold release. Yeah. How, how can you balance the two things, you know, having a, a longer period and not having cold release? Because you said it yourself. It must be within, yeah, the, the supervisory period. And, and I think this is where reading extracts of the earlier evidence could potentially be a bit misleading. Because, you know, if if you'd said to me it's it's cold release or it's three months, then I would have said three months. If you say to me it's cold release or it's six months, I want six. If you say it's cold release or 12, I want 12. I want longer in the per, in the framework of the total custodial sentence. I want the longest possible period of uh, supervision and support in the community to, to mitigate the effects of imprisonment and to secure public safety. The parole board's dilemma is that the longer it, it waits to make the release decision, the more likely it is that the, um, the desistance, if you like, is, is going to be frustrated. The earlier you can release, the better you can support re-entry. But of course, if you're not confident that you can safely release, you have to hold. So it's it's in the 
in the discretionary period, which I would say is between 50% and 75%. That's a, a long period, potentially, to incentivise a long-term prisoner to engage with the parole board. If they don't do enough and they have to be released at the 75% period, it's still a long period of supervision during which the social worker can work to secure engagement and to reduce risks constructively, as well as supporting reintegration. So, you know, I, I, my, my honest feeling about the current proposal is that it's, it's certainly better than the first draft. Yes. It, it, it clearly improves the situation. It deals with cold release up to a point. Six months will help a significant proportion of those that the bill will affect to a certain extent. Will it secure their reintegration? I, I doubt it. And as long as their reintegration isn't secured, public safety isn't ultimately served. Now, we don't live in a perfect world, and um, there are some people for whom no amount of supervision is going to secure reintegration, and there will always be risk after the, the criminal justice system steps back and says, we have no longer the authority to interfere in your life. Um, but I, my... my my belief is that uh, a longer period of supervision, particularly for long sentence prisoners, is more likely to support their desistance rather than less. So we'll come back to the question, if I may. I'm, I'm sorry. If, I, if, I, I, if, if I can. Yeah, if, please, Professor Tata, come in yeah, and you come back. It's just, I, I, I really think it's important we focus on the question, what problem is this bill trying to solve? Yeah, well, we answered that, that part of, as far, Mr. Uh, Professor McNeil answered that part, it's, it's about public safety. It's, it's exactly what it is. That's, that's what it... That's what it's striving it's to do. Um, I suppose what I'm telling you is that I don't think it. I don't think in in comparison with the current system, I'm not at all convinced that this makes the public any more safe. And in fact, although I can only hypothesise based on my understanding of people's uh, progression towards desistance from crime, but my hypothesis would be that being held longer and being released after a longer period of imprisonment with all the disruption and uh, problems that that causes to a short period of support where I know that the social worker is disappearing in six months, I don't think I'm heavily incentivised to engage seriously with that social worker by that. Um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to formally comply. I'm going to show up for the appointments, get through this and get him or her off my back and out of my life and then I'm going to carry on. And I, I don't think that that's the best way to secure public safety. There, there could be an explanation of uh, why uh, so many people said three months. It's maybe having a shorter period uh, regarding cost, regarding quality of, of program. You maybe have a better quality program, particularly that, you know, we said that things are going to change and there's going to be progress in, in prison first and foremost. It, you know, uh, can, can we have a very good, you know, a year uh, program sustainable is it, is it sustainable or, uh, or is a six month period in fact a, a good balance we know we know in general terms uh, from the evidence base that programs to reduce reoffending work better in the community than in prison and that there's a very obvious reason for this it's that uh, when you're trying to learn skills that you're going to use in the community it's easier to learn them in the community because in between sessions you can practice uh, if you do a prison in, in a prison based program you can learn skills for tackling the problems that you'll face outside, but you can't really rehearse and embed the learning. It's a bit like the challenges that students face when they're trying to take classroom learning out onto placements in vocational courses. But we, Same we, sort of transfer. Mm -hmm. So a longer period of supervision where more work to support rehabilitation programme work and individual work can be undertaken in the, the context and the environment where the learning needs to be applied stands better prospects of securing reductions in risk than, uh, than prison-based programmes, in my assessment. And I, I do th that, that's an evidence-based point, which I think, um, from a scientific point of view, I can support, as opposed to hypothesising. I know that community-based programmes have, generally have better outcomes to reduce reoffending. Uh, that's not to say that we shouldn't do lots of work in prison to prepare people for release and to address the issues that we can address while they are inside. But the key thing is to get the money out of the jail and into the community so that the programmes... Uh, and I don't mean programme just in the narrow classroom sense, but programmes of support, if you like, can be properly resourced and properly delivered by trained professionals supported by third sector organisations, supported by community organisations, doing advocacy, building bridges, making connections, securing essentially a sense of belonging to community, which is what ultimately um, sustains people's desistance from crime. Which, which I put it to you, it would be easier for people who will be released earlier in a discretionary 
the uh, earlier a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, you know there's no questions the parole board and, and, and some prisoners will yeah. be will be quite happy to yeah. engage so, and, so and, and to do that the, the problem is the one who wanted to max out yes. and it's this one okay. we really want to deal with yeah so the ones that that want to max out um are going to be difficult to engage in in any but context i accept that um but I don't think that that in itself means that it makes more sense to hold them longer. Um, I also think that by keeping calling it release is because we know it's a continuing exactly. it's a continuing sentence. Yeah. And as I understand it, for the cabinet secretary, different conditions. So we didn't delve into that would be attached yeah. to this period in the community. Maybe we should have yeah. gone further it, into it would be what much conditions more, we're talking about. It would be much more helpful if we thought of release as being release from the order. Or release from the yeah, sentence. Uh, yeah, it, but it, obviously, we think of walking out of a prison gate as the end of the sentence, and clearly it's not, and no. nor should it be. And but also, there's recall. It, yeah. I, we never went into whether you'd be tagged or whatever yeah. things are, would be required. It could and be quite, quite onerous. Yeah, well, no, we, we grossly, I, I think um, th this is also being driven home to me by research that I'm currently conducting with people subject to supervision um, mm. in a number of European countries. and. We grossly underestimate the, the pain of being subject to that suspension of punishment um, and the, the prospect of being recalled, recalled yeah. uh, at the discretion of another person leaves uh, the, the, the released person exceptionally vulnerable and insecure. Um, now, you, you can say from a justice point of view, well, fair enough, that's, that's part of your sentence and you've, you've c conducted yourself in such a way that the state yeah. has the right to exercise that power over you and is doing so now to protect others. Um, but we shouldn't underestimate what it feels like to be not quite at liberty, to be uh, having the sort of Damocles dangling over your head continuously is, is no small suffering. Um, it would be helpful to describe it as such mm -hmm. publicly. That's, the yep. system's very poor at explaining itself. Uh, what we call the sort of Damocles. <laughs> I know you don't mean that. Uh, yes, because I've got John and Alison yeah. waiting. Um, yeah, wording is very important. What do you think, uh, uh, Professor McNeil? Um, have we removed automatic early release if this bill go through as we know it? Do you think the word automatic will slowly and surely get a, get out, get get away from the from the language? I, I doubt that. Uh, the political opponents of the government would allow them to get away with that, uh, and and. It, you know, we're we're changing the regime of automatic early release with this bill, um, but we're not abolishing automatic early release. Manifestly, it continues, but now it's fixed at six months. That's that's automatic for a few amount of people, and especially for the max out one. Well, how many people are affected by it depends on the judgments that the parole board make yeah. and how conservatively they apply the risk criteria. So we don't really know the numbers because we don't know how they will weigh the the. The, the two risks, this is a, maybe a better way of thinking about it. There's the risk of releasing now and there's the risk of not releasing now, which is that we're storing up a bigger problem later. Mm -hmm. So it's not risk versus no risk. It's risk now or risk later. Um, and I think that how exactly parole board decision making is influenced by this change in, in the timing of, of early release, I'm, I'm not sure we can predict that. John. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, Professors. Uh, Professor McNeill, I, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to see Dr Monica Barry's evidence to us, and she touches on many of the points that you alluded to there and the pressures of people on supervision. And it would seem there's a, a number of issues at play here. We're told the government wished to reduce the prison population. Clearly, more resources would be required to be transferred to, to the community. Mm -hmm. um, she concludes by saying, the longer the period of supervision, brackets, and the greater the perception that supervision is merely monitoring risk rather than proactive support, the more likelihood of breach. Yeah. Yet, yet you argue for longer. Can you yeah. explain that? And I don't think, I don't, if I'm reading uh, Dr Barry's submission correctly, she's not arguing against supervision. She's no. talking about the character of supervision. And her current research, which I had the benefit of hearing about last week at a conference at Strathclyde University, um, the, the concern that she's expressing based on her findings is that released prisoners are experiencing supervision as nothing more than monitoring and control, when in fact they have very significant needs uh, for support in terms of reintegration, which in their view are not being met. So they're being asked to comply with a regime of control, 
but they're not really being incentivised uh, by being offered support that they find meaningful. So I don't she think she talks about proactive support. They should yeah. give. And, and do yeah. you understand what what that might? Well, proactive support would would involve essentially, and this is where Pete White's um, voice would be particularly useful. It, it means going to the person um, who's who's to be released uh, during the prison sentence and having. Uh, a thorough discussion about what their post-release plans and prospects are, who's important to them, what kind of resources and supports they have in the community, um, what personal resources and assets they have in terms of their skills, their abilities, their ambitions, um, their previous education, their future plans, and really trying to work creatively and constructively with that individual to develop a shared release plan which is based on navigating what is going to be a difficult transition. That's not the same thing as going to the person and saying, my tool tells me that you're, you have five risk factors. These risk factors must be addressed in order for you to be released. After release, we will seek to manage these risk factors by controlling your access to X, Y, or Z, or by putting you on a tag, or by making you submit to restriction. So one is kind of educative and facilitative and proactive in the sense of trying to identify the resources, identify the needs, and work with the person um, to provide the best possible resettlement package, which I also think is a human right, as I've explained to you previously. The other is a system of control which is designed, if you like, purely to protect the public and not to address the prisoner's needs. Uh, unwittingly, it then fails to protect the public because the two things are symbiotically related. You seem to be describing what might be an individual risk assessment. And, and would that not suggest an individual um, disposal for that, rather than one that seems to be based simply on the arithmetic of you've been here for X, so that means X here? Well, the, the, the current system does involve individualised assessment of risk and need. It maybe doesn't um, look so closely as I think it might at strengths and resources and positive uh, assets that a person might bring, although the, the organisational review of the prison service is trying to move um, in that direction, partly informed by the sorts of research that I've been involved with myself historically. So um, it, it's more than risk assessment, though. You know, risk assessment, if you like, uh, it identifies problems, um, it, it identifies needs, it gives guidance, it gives some guidance on what the social worker or the uh, prison psychologist or whoever's involved might do to how they might best target their efforts. But the problem with the way that risk assessment is used is that often the, the, the professionals under the pressure of public scrutiny about managing risk, they, they, they complete the, the, the assessment to identify what the risks are and then they develop a plan to manage the risks. That's not the same thing as reducing them. Could I say, say I, I'm meaning risk assessment smally, can, yeah. it's, it's small r, small e, <laughs> and individual. And of course yeah. that would consider all the Positive yeah, factors it, it that should inform. It clearly and should. And it may come out that it's that it's um, you know five months would be suitable for one person and seven for another. It's. I just wonder if this tariff scheme ignores the individual. Any threshold that is set, whether it's set proportionately or whether it's set by a fixed time period at the end of the sentence, runs that risk. And I guess that's that's a question of balance. I, I think if you have a system which is entirely discretionary. Um, the, the problem is then that you, you leave a lot of power in the hands of professionals who are making subjective judgments, which under the pressure of public scrutiny can become more and more precautionary and defensive, delaying and delaying and delaying release and leading you back to your maxing out problem. So I think I would still support the idea of proportional thresholds that basically say, OK, we've held this risk as long as we can hold it. Now our job is to get out in the community and reduce it. I, I think it's Dr... Uh, Barry, uh, forgive me, but it's not. It might be either of yourselves. I want you to comment on the the view that professionals are in this field are risk averse for the very reasons you've outlined. Uh, again, I, I, I'll, well, I'll answer briefly, and then um, my colleague can give his opinion. I, certainly, the impression I gained from the evidence that was presented at the conference in Strathclyde last week would tend to suggest that the balance between the need to take risk to reduce risk, you know, the, the kind of proactive attempt to engage in, in strategies which um, 
give us confidence that skills are being acquired and used, just like in, in child rearing, you know, you get to a stage with your kids where you have to let the rope out a bit in order to see if they've learned. Um, and similarly in this context, if you hold too tight and overprotect, um, you, you run the risk of diminishing the capacity of the person to manage themselves effectively. And I, I think that the, the evidence from Dr. Barry and Dr. Weaver's study at Strathclyde tends to suggest that, that the system has begun to move a little bit too far in the precautionary direction. That's my impression, but I, you know, as, a, as a social scientist, I should be careful to, to separate my, uh, my impression from what I think I can evidence empirically. I'm not sure I can evidence that empirically. Certainly, recall rates have, rates have gone through the roof. We've, and the McLeish report is very clear on this, a massive increase in the number of people who are being recalled to custody, even before 2008. Um, and I think the numbers have continued to rise to a certain extent. Um, so it, it seems as if something has changed, and it's not obvious that it's the conduct of the people subject to supervision that have changed, to put it that way. Thank you. And of course, uh, there's no respite from the press if something... Uh, that's the real, uh, yeah. the real court of law, isn't it? For uh, yeah. if, as you quite rightly say, it's a, a question of uh, risk, a, a mi minor risk taken by those managing the system and those who yeah. are within it, who are yeah. under the supervision. It's true, but one uh, little slip and there's there's no escape. But again, I, I can understand all... why people, oh, uh, social workers, are just I've, have I've, to cover their backs. I've so been much. in the position, uh, you know, when I was a practicing social worker, of having to make those calls, and it's it's extremely yes. um, demanding work, and it deserves to be yes. much better respected and supported than it is. Um, but what I would say is that we all collectively have a responsibility in my current job um, for elected members, uh, for all sort of aspects of civil society to contribute to that debate um, rather than hiding from it. And I think there's, uh, to a certain extent, the profession, uh, social work profession needs to advocate for itself and to, to be more um, confident and assertive in its engagement with public debate. And uh, uh, some of the government's other reforms, for example, in relation to the new community justice um, measures, well, I think help to provide national leadership that can enhance the quality of the That's debate. That's coming to us as well, actually. In due course, yeah. We volunteer to take it, even though that will be our sixth bill. You are clearly <laughs> gluttons for punishment. <laughs> 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 Professor Tata. I, I don't really have a lot to add. I mean, I think Professor McNeil has explained that very well and very eloquently, or just to put it bluntly, I suppose, that having a system of mandatory release kind of saves parole boards from that dilemma. Professor McNeil was outlining. It allows them to say, OK, we're not going to get the blame for that. Someone has to be released, and there's a good reason why they have to be released at a certain point, because it serves public safety. Thank you. Can you get one final question for me? I actually thought Professor McNeil was saying something different. I thought he was talking about the way, um, if we proceed with this with mandatory, a community part of your sentence, that there has to be a different way of managing the individual who is out, sure. Both which things isn't are true. to do with, and I think John made the point quite rightly, it wasn't risk assessment in capital letters, it was to do with more engagement, obviously there's that part of it, but more engagement with what would cure, what would help that individual along the way as well, yeah. in sure. a different way, and that does involve social workers sometimes. Yeah. Taking, and I don't want to use the word risk, but making a judgement call. Mm -hmm that they feel free to be able to do in those circumstances. May I perhaps put it like that? I think, I think is that correct? That's well, that, that's a summary of what I said. That's correct. But I also agree with what my colleague well, I didn't. I didn't want well. to cause division between oh, no. us. I know you're, you're, you're doing so well together. <laughs> yes, sorry, John. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. It's just to take you back briefly, Professor Tata, to, to your comment about um, the human rights aspects of this. Yeah. The government seemed very relaxed about it, as, as you suggest. That mm. uh, relaxed position isn't shared by the Scottish Human Rights Commission, mm. nor indeed uh, the Howard League's comments. Um, could you maybe just comment a bit more on that? Yeah. Just because something hasn't as yet been subject to challenge doesn't yeah. mean necessarily that it ticks all the boxes. I think it? you make an excellent point, uh, John Finney. Um, I think at the end of their note from last week, there's a very brief paragraph from the Scottish government that says something like, we see no case law, and they chose the word about determinate sentence prisoners, which would cause a problem in terms of having fair opportunity to access programmes in prison to show you're not a risk. But of course, the case law that there is, is about indeterminate sentences. I think it's unlikely, I see no reason of principle why, that idea, that principle, uh, where the courts have said, 
there has to be fair opportunity in when they were presented with an indeterminate case. I'm thinking, for example, about the case of James and others. Um, that that principle wouldn't be extrapolated to, to determinate sentence cases. So if you take someone, and there will be the desire and the will, understandably, among people sentenced to lengthy periods, if you're sentenced to a period of 12 years, you would have been getting automatic release by, what, eight years. You may now, if you can't access programmes, or you don't feel you've been given fair opportunity to show you're not a risk, you're not getting out to 11 and a half. So three and a half years extra. Those three and a half years, you're going to say, this is not fair. You're going to have a burning sense of injustice. Who wouldn't? I would too. If it was the case that you didn't have fair opportunity to access and to show that you're not a risk. So I think that the note there is a little bit too relaxed. And I think lawyers who deal in this area would confirm that to you. We have been here before sometimes with human rights legislation where governments have said in the past, oh, not a problem, not a problem. Stick your head in, sit the heads in the sand and the problem comes up later. I don't think that note is quite enough. I think we need to think more carefully about it. The principle is a really simple one. Fair opportunity to make your case. If you're not given fair opportunity, then uh, there's going to be a sense of injustice. I think that will, that will come. Just to make an, an obvious um, arithmetic, arithmetical point, um, at the moment, one of the reasons why a determinate sentence prisoner might not seek to litigate is that we're only talking about the difference between 50% and 66%. Um, under these measures, we're talking about the difference between 50% and, well, something approaching 100% yes. eventually as the sentences become very long. So, again, I, if I were a, a prisoner serving a very long sentence who was unhappy about access to rehabilitative support and not just programmes, uh, you know, in the custodial context and I'd got past my halfway point and, and I didn't feel that I was being supported to make progress, I would be consulting my lawyer and, yeah, and so I think I should. Just a brief word to say, it's bound to have some effect on the ability to manage prisoners who, who feel upset, angry, feel they've been treated unjustly. I don't know if Mr Campbell is coming with a supplementary or just a... It's, it's a bit, I, I would have thought that the Scottish Prison Service will be acutely aware of these issues and acutely aware to try and avoid uh, um, the position where they ended up at the, the wrong end of litigation in the courts. I'm sure they would be, but it's not really the prison service's responsibility. This, this is the government. Okay. Yeah, okay, we'll leave You're there. pitched in there, Alison. Um, Professor McNeil, do you think it would be feasible um, to put on the face of the bill the sort of description of what you think licence conditions or the, 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 the time served under supervision in the community would actually look like? Um, I, I, actually, I don't know the answer yeah. to that question because I'm, I'm not at all expert in the parliamentary process, so I'm not sure how far... Uh, amendments to a bill as presented can go towards altering its purpose. focus or purpose, probably not very far, and uh, that was why I kind of, in earlier evidence my instinct was to start again, um, so I, 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 I'm afraid I can't really be clearer than that. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's something we're looking at. I know that there are, there is, an, an, a, to the long, what's it say here, there's an amendment to the long title, um, and uh, leave out from end to sentence and to amend the rules for, automatic, for prisoners on licence. So that's really all, but I don't know whether that would be changing the purposes of the bill, Alison. So I think yeah. that's, that's an issue, that. perhaps, that mm. if you want to raise the government. An example, you, I think you could, you could very clearly, uh, anybody, I presume, could propose an amendment which said, no, let's have uh, the current system uh, where we have 50% uh, is the point at which you become eligible for consideration for parole, and let's have... Um, mandatory release at 75% and let's put an amendment to that effect before the Parliament. Well, that, that could be done, but it couldn't be done in a way which would address the problem no. of transparency because... No, to, we to understand that. So, yeah. Yeah, we understand you could change it from yeah, six, six months, months to something yeah. else, but I don't think we could... I don't know if it's possible... But whether we could whether insert be something which said mm, yeah. and now a custodial sentence is to be called yes, a custodial and supervision sentence, or you yeah, know, I'm not yeah. sure. Right. Have we, have we exhausted questions? Anything else you want to raise with us that we haven't asked? Well, Professor Tata, you're taking a deep breath. <laughs> something coming. Well, 
I suppose, you know, what, I have to ask the question, why are we doing this? Well, we've had that. But, so, we've right, had that bit. That message so, loud and clear. So the, <laughs> the very bit of the system that works best is going to be squeezed back, um, and the cost of it is going to take the majority of the, the current community justice budget. The government says that it wants to work towards penal reduction. There seems to be a degree yes. of consensus cross-party around that, and yet... The concrete measure we have here is to do quite the opposite. Now, projects like, I think the Cabinet Secretary may have mentioned uh, the uh, uh, Tomorrow's Women project, for example, in Glasgow, a great project, came out of the Angelini Commission's yes. report. Now, their budget, as far as I know, remains incredibly precarious. So while we're praising the work that's done there, they have no long-term funding. The one bit of the system we're going wow. to guarantee for greatly increased funding is... Prison service. Now, none of that is criticism of the work that's being done in prison. It might be even worse so, after we hear what's announced in terms of the budget for the Scottish Parliament coming along. So, you know, so bear why, with me in that. So why spend so much more, the £30 million, on a bill that the evidence suggests is going well, to reduce public safety, that is not going to abolish automatic early release or anything like that? Ask a very brief question. If, if if we were going to remove the six months and substitute a percentage of the sentence, what would your advice be in, in regard of what that percentage would be? Minimum 25%. 25%. I think that came through some minimum 25 think? I think 50 sounded a bit big. Mm. But 25%, I think, was... Mm. Well, can I thank you very much? As usual, stimulating, interesting. It was almost like a legal seminar where <laughs> Mr. Camp was about to jump in in the debate rather than question, but that's fine. Thank you very much. That ends the session, and I formally close the meeting.